Um, I'd like to welcome everybody who's joined us, both in person and online. Uh, my name is Kira Kuglikova. I'm the director for the Division of Conference Management here at the United Nations office in Geneva. So the context, just to give a sense of sort of the context, first of all, just a reminder that this is a publicly available event, so um, there, will, there may be people joining us from outside the UN community. If so, welcome. We appreciate having you join us. Um, the event is going to be recorded, um, so just bear that in mind. The context in particular, the UN every year celebrates on um, April 28th, the World Day for Safety and Health at Work. And it may not be immediately obvious how this topic is relevant to the Division of Conference Management, but that's exactly what we're going to be exploring here today. The point of World Day for Safety and Health at Work is to raise international awareness around the effort to make work environments safe and healthy for all. The film that we'll be watching, In Flow of Words, it centers on the experiences of three interpreters who served at the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, known as ICTY, um, in The Hague. The interpreters were forced to, are forced to contend with their personal memories and traumas while they're doing their work interpreting about things that which they may have personally experienced. And while they work, they do their interpretation, they must, of course, maintain full neutrality and full professionalism for their work. This is something that some of our colleagues have experience with, and it's far more difficult, perhaps, than people have thought about. And this is one of the things that the director, um, Ms. Botts, brings out in the film. Um, so our interpreters, so in addition to the work that people do in the booth, the interpretation booth, which is a very contained environment, so there's the booth, there's the conference room, very stable like we have now, very calm. That is the bulk of the work that our colleagues are doing. However, we also support field missions, and many of those field missions involve very difficult mandates, such as torture, violence against women, and other issues. So working out in the field is a completely different experience. Um, we had in 2017, for instance, there were 96 missions that were serviced with interpretation with the support of 202 interpreters. 2018, there were 90 missions that were serviced with 185 interpreters. Many of the interpreters that work field missions, some of them are staff colleagues, but often because the language combination isn't one that we have from the staff in-house, then we work with freelance interpreters. So when they're out in the field, UN interpreters have to leave the safety of their booth in this conference setting, and they're venturing out into unknown. The field conditions can be very difficult. People can be visiting prisons. They can be going to places where there may be unrest, um, and they may be working with very difficult topics uh, and working with the victims of human rights violations. So what this brings, then, is in addition to the potential physical safety and security concerns, there's also often a very heavy mental and psychological toll on interpreters who have to listen to people describing horrific things, take that in, turn that into the language they work with, and then issue it out as interpretation. Um, and I think we'll see from the film that this can leave some traces behind. So let me introduce our panel. First, we have the moderator, who is Alma Bargut, who is the chief of the Arabic interpretation, interpretation section here in uh, Geneva. In addition to her career at the United Nations, Alma has been working with the local Université de Genève, acting as a deputy lecturer at the Department of Interpretation, mm -hmm. and contributing to the field of research surrounding interpretation, providing her expertise in interpreting on UN field missions interpreting at the UN, as well as speed and simultaneous interpretation and other topics. So thank you, Alma, for moderating. We also are very fortunate to have with us here in person um, Eliane Esther Botts, who is a director, writer, and editor of the film In Flow of Words. The film has already won several awards, among which the Pardis de Domini Best Director at the, the Bonalume Edu Engineering Award of the Locarno Film Festival, the film was also nominated for the 2021 European Film Awards. Currently, Eliana is a lecturer for uh, Moving Image at the University of the Arts in Utrecht, Nederland, while also lecturing at the Nederlands Film Academy. She has also been working on programming for the Go Short Film Festival in Nijmegen in Holland. So thank you for coming. Thank you. We also have Marie Duer, who is the chief of the interpretation service here at DCM. Uh, Marie has over 30 years of experience in interpretation. 
Before she joined the UN, she worked over 12 years freelancing for European agencies, the European Union, and the private market. In 2001, she joined the United Nations office at Vienna as chief of the French booth, then as chief interpreter. She joined us here at UNOG as chief of the interpretation service in December of 2017. So thank you, Marie. We also have remotely Mr. Manfred Nowak, who is the secretary general of the Global Campus of Human Rights and a former UN special rapporteur on torture. He was appointed secretary general of the Global Campus of Human Rights in 2016, while also being the independent expert leading the United Nations Global, United National Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty. Mr. Nowak has authored more than 600 publications in the fields of constitutional, administrative, and international law, human rights, as well as development studies. Of his extensive career, some of his most recent activities are acting member of the Board of Director of Dignity, which is the Danish Institute Against Torture in Copenhagen, co-founder and board member of the Vienna Former Forum for Diplomacy, excuse me, Forum for Democracy and Human Rights, and scientific director at the Vienna Master of Applied Human Rights Program at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. We also have with us Besmir Vidahic, who is a former translator and interpreter at the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and he's one of the interpreters featured in the film. Besmir has been working with the UN since 1994 as translator, interpreter, and editor. He, in 2020, he published a book on linguistic justice at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The book treats language justice, it goes into language justice in the realm of international criminal law. So let me thank everyone for joining, those of you remotely and in person, and I will now give the floor to Alma. Alma, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kira. Thank you for your introductory remarks. Uh, I think we're all here to see the movie first and for, foremost. So uh, can we directly start with that? Yeah. And then we'll hold a panel discussion and we'll take questions and answers after screening uh, the film on all us interpreters. Uh, thank you for that. You've brought to light uh, issues that are very often unknown to the uh, general public, even sometimes to the UN uh, colleagues, and even interpreters who do not work in this particular context. So thank you very much for that. Uh, of course, my first question is uh, obvious. Why did you do this film? Well, first, uh, thank you all for the invitation. Uh, I feel very honored to be here, and thank you for coming. I hope that some of you are also uh, interpreters. Yeah. Um, and your question, why I made this film? Well, it actually started very simple. I met Alma, one of the interpreters in the film, at a film festival in The Hague. And she was behind the camera and I asked her, hey, you're a fellow filmmaker, uh, cool. And she said, yeah, yeah, I'm a filmmaker, but actually my profession is an interpreter. And then she, she briefly uh, told me about her experiences at the ICTY. And then I realized I never thought about this. I never considered the position of interpreters and specifically her position as an interpreter for the ICTY having gone through the war herself. And I think this was the moment that I realized if I didn't think about this before in my life and I'm 36, I mean I had some time to consider this, uh, then probably other people also didn't think about interpreters. I mean they're not, uh, you <laughs> are not very visible most of the time. And that's when I decided that, okay, I want to, to know more about this. I want to talk to Alma, have conversations with her, and see where this brings us. And uh, Alma introduced me to the other interpreters, uh, Besmir and Pops. Um, and that's when we started to work together, actually. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, just to come back to your why question, I felt it is important. I felt it is important to shine light on a profession, on people that are doing such an important work and are not being seen and are mostly considered, at least that's what I understood, as human machines. So that's the reason why, yeah. 
And could you please tell us how the film was received and what yeah. kind of reactions yes. you had to it? Yeah. Um, well, um, of course, it's an exciting and also a very scary process to make a film. I don't work with a script. I work in close cooperation with, with the people. Uh, so the film was really an experiment also. We really made it together. And when it was finished, I thought, I enjoy it. I think it's a powerful film, but you never know. And uh, the past, like, nine months have been amazing. I mean, the film so far has won eight awards uh, in major film festivals. The audience is really, like me, like, wow, we didn't know about this. We never thought about this. And I think the beautiful thing is that a lot of interpreters approach me. So it's not only interpreters from the ICTY, but even interpreters who who interpret, uh, for example, at film festivals. And they say, okay, I'm in a different context, but... I kind of feel represented by uh, by the film, and I think that's most important. Uh, these responses to the film, so um, yeah, it's been really overwhelming actually uh, the responses, and I'm happy that it's also now being shown outside film festivals. So it's sometimes shown at universities uh, where uh, interpretation studies are, are being taught while here. So um, I like that that the film also has another life, that it has another. Um, possibility to to share uh, these narratives. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we here at the UN are truly uh, honored to have you in person and to have this uh, very special screening uh, of your film. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, Bismir, who is with us online. Uh, Bismir, your testimonial uh, in the film really does speak volumes, and I personally could relate uh, a lot to while watching, and I even relived some of my own traumatic experiences as as I'm watching the film now. Um, Could you please tell us a little bit more about your experience um, participating in this film? And I was also wondering, was it a catharsis for you in any way? Yes, good morning. Merci, Kteria Alma. Anna Bahadak, baby. Good morning, everyone. I, uh, good morning, Kira. Good morning, uh, Marie. Good morning, uh, Eliane. Uh, yes, uh, in the very beginning, I really need to acknowledge the fact how Eliane managed to describe the realities of what we do in the United Nations. Um, and I would really like to acknowledge and thank uh, Kira and all of you for organizing uh, this visibility uh, for um, the pain and hardship that so many of us are going privately while we are doing this important work for the UN. Um, my experience with Eliane was absolutely beautiful. I am really floored how she managed to uh, to capture the realities of what happens when a uh, war crimes interpreter uh, comes home, you know. What happens when the microphones are switched off, when clients uh, uh, go away, and uh, what happens when you're alone at home with your own thoughts and when you are processing what you were talking about all day long for uh, for years and years. This is a, a story about... Uh, about the lack of institutional support and a story of uh, um, uh, of silence, basically. Uh, it was cathart- uh, I did go t- through some sort of catharsis right now, where I feel that my colleagues who know uh, what uh, we have been going through, uh, when you are acknowledging my feelings, when you are acknowledging my experiences. Um, it's it's a huge thing for me uh, to be here in this room with you. Uh, uh, from that point of view, it is a catharsis. It is also catharsis uh, from the point of view of uh, telling our story to uh, to the world. You know, uh, people think that we don't do important work, and uh, we are like airplanes. You know, everybody knows when an uh, airplane is, uh, uh, you know, crashed, but nobody talks about some uh, thousands of airplanes that land success- successfully every day. So, 
the mainstream is not very well informed about what we do. And from that point of view, it is also catharsis because now people are starting to know. All in all, it was an um, absolutely beautiful experience, and um, I'm very, very happy that uh, many more people, many more colleagues are coming out and uh, sharing their own stories um, about uh, these experiences with the UN. Thank you so much for that, Bismir, and I'm sure we'll have many more questions for you uh, after I first to the table of the panelists. Uh, I would like uh, now to uh, uh, give the floor to Manfred, Manfred Novak, who has been uh, introduced uh, at length by Kira. Um, it's truly an honor to have you with us, Manfred. Um, I met uh, Manfred on a, a special rapporteur mission uh, when he was formerly the SR on torture. Uh, to Jordan, it was at the time. Um, but I just discovered that Manfred was also the UN independent expert on the special process on missing persons in former Yugoslavia, which links us uh, very uh, timely with the, with the film we just saw. And I believe you were involved, uh, Manfred, directly when the mass graves were opened in Srebrenica, and you were also working with interpreters there. So I think all of us here would love to hear uh, your words, uh, reactions to the film, and maybe you can share some of your experience in this regard. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much also for inviting me, and sorry that I, I cannot be with you in, in person, Alma. Um, I have been um, <clears throat> leading this special process uh, already during the time of the war, uh, since 1993 four, uh, when we also went to what we saw in the film also, um, the Prieto area with the concentration camps of Moscow and others, um, um, with uh, the, the help of interpreters to, to try to find uh, missing persons uh, at, at that time during the war. But then Srebrenica happened <clears throat> and um, I was among the first uh, international experts that was, uh, who was allowed to actually visit uh, Srebrenica. Um, and we started also opening uh, mass claims with a team of forensic experts um, and I work closely together <clears throat> also with the forensic experts of the of the ICTY. So the ICTY was interested to find um, crimes. I was interested to find in those mass graves um, human beings whom we then could uh, uh, bring to the morgue uh, in Dusseldorf for identification purposes. And um, uh, after identification, you you needed uh, to speak to the families, and that was, of course, with interpreters. Um, so first, we developed an antemortem database. That means uh, we had to ask the mothers or the uh, the parents or the, the the spouses of those people, um, can you tell us uh, what kind of physical marks they had? Did they have a finger missing or a tooth missing, etc.? Uh, and the people say, but we want you to bring back our our son or our husband, and uh, and I don't want to answer this 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 these strange questions. And we always had to explain, but in order to know whether your son is still alive or not, we have to look into mass graves and see to find him. Um, and um, and that was very very difficult. So our interpreters uh, couldn't do that for, for a long period of time. They always needed psychological counseling, etc. And of course, the same is if you really start opening mass graves is one of the, the most difficult experience that you can, can imagine. Um, uh, later, when I, when I became special rapporteur on torture, um, yeah, uh, I carried out 18 fact-finding missions to countries in all regions of the world in order to investigate torture. But torture always takes place behind closed doors. So most of the time, 
uh, in those fact-finding missions we spent in prisons, police detention centers, uh, in special institutions for children with disabilities, in psychiatric hospitals, migration-related detention centers, etc. Um, and that is already a big uh, challenge for interpreters who have never been in a prison. If you, um, I mean, there are many open prisons. You go in there in a male prison with female interpreters, um, and uh, uh, and people are going around, they're all imprisoned because most of them have uh, committed crimes. But then you also have to, to, to sit down with individual prisoners in order to do an interview about whether they have been tortured. I mean, I remember, Alma, when we, we went to Jordan, uh, one of the strongest experiences was when we came to the criminal, the headquarters of the criminal investigation department in uh, in Amman, and um, we came at 11 o'clock in the evening. It was a surprise visit always, and we knocked on the door, and they didn't want to open. And then we heard that they, there was all kind of noises because they tried while we were waiting to bring the prisoners away because they were all tortured. And finally, we, we forced our way in there, and then we saw what many people call a smoking gun. We, we, we saw those most tortured individuals didn't manage because they, they, they couldn't walk. Um, so they didn't manage to, to, to be brought outside. And we immediately had to interview this person who was had been subjected to Palestinian hanging, one of the worst forms of, of torture. Um, or um, a woman who has had uh, committed a terrorist attack um, on the uh, on a hotel in Amman, and he she was sentenced to death. And uh, but she didn't want to speak to any man, also not to my forensic expert. So it was you who actually could speak uh, with her about uh, yeah what she did and also what she feels when she knows that she would be soon executed. In in Indonesia, we had a uh, one of the Bali bombers was the other way around. He didn't want to speak for religious reasons with any woman. So uh, we had to uh, kind of uh, deal with him. Uh, if you if you are in this, this closed institutions, I mean, there is so much misery that you see. Uh, many people tell you, yeah, we had been tortured, but now look at overcrowding. It's dirty. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's a very, very tough job. And often in the evening, for me, it was important that everybody was part of the team, not only the human rights experts who carried out the, the research, but also and the fact-finding mission, but also the interpreters, the drivers, uh, the security personnel. We were all one big team. And uh, often, or more or less every evening, we were sitting down after a very, very difficult and hard day in hot, um, dirty prisons, sitting down and trying to do a debriefing. Uh, and that was, for me, the most important. What was the worst experience for you today? Then you perhaps don't join us tomorrow so that you stay a day in the hotel. Um, it is really uh, both from a physical and from a mental point of view, it is very, very tough work if you speak to people who have been seriously tortured, who have been witnessing that others have been tortured, others have been killed, um, and, and, and you speak to those people, um, that is often heartbreaking. If you're seeing children in particular, for me, children was the most difficult, um, in prisons already or in orphanages under terrible circumstances. We saw them in, in Moldova, in, in Kazakhstan. If you go to Chinese prisons and, and, and speak to, to, to those people, it is very difficult. And I think it is very important that all those who are part of these fact-finding missions, whether these are human rights experts, whether they are interpreters or, or, or others, um, that, um, that then get the, the, the necessary psychological counseling um, during or at least at the end of, of, of these missions. Sometimes you're also in very dangerous situations. We were often threatened uh, by the police, by the military. I remember in, in Togo, when you enter big military uh, barracks and then I had to speak to the <clears throat> to the the head, the commander, but at the same time, we knew where the prisoners were. So I asked the rest of the staff, including the interpreters, can you please 
stand there in order to make sure that nobody enters or leaves uh, these detention facilities. And the soldiers were extremely aggressive. And uh, um, and they managed. Uh, I, I remember Roger Cumminger, one of my uh, interpreters who okay, came most often. He was standing there and really defending uh, in front of the um, of the gate uh, that nobody could actually enter against all those aggression in the middle of the hot sun. Um, and, um, and 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 the same happened in in, in so many other countries in Papua Guinea, uh, in Jamaica, for instance. Often you are. Uh, interpreting um, an interview with a death row prisoner. And we have seen death row prisoners in Nigeria, in, in, in Jamaica, in China, in Mongolia. It was some of the worst uh, what, what I have ever seen. Um, and uh, you speak to these poor individuals, uh, but the interpreter is the one who is the tyrant interlocutor. So the, 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 the prisoner doesn't really directly speak to me. Um, he or she speaks to the interpreter and then trying to get some kind of empathy and understanding from the from the interpreter, although she, she is only or he is only uh, yeah trying trying to interpret. So very often you really have to explain then yourself uh, to the to the prisoner and of course also show empathy, but at the same time, remain professional and that means also objective and uh, and simply trying to translate what the person is saying um uh, yeah i could go on but i think i have my five minutes are really uh, over um, is for me i must say i had the privilege of working with the the best interpreters you can imagine and also the best forensic experts that were provided to me by the united nations otherwise we wouldn't have been able to do this extremely challenging work. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you so much. And I'm sure you have a lot, a lot more uh, examples and stories to share. And uh, I would have a question or two, but we'll wait for the round of Q&As. Uh, I would um, now like to uh, uh, give the floor to Marie, Marie Dior, uh, and thank her for being with us here today. I know she has an extremely busy schedule. And Marie's presence is twofold. So uh, Marie is an interpreter, first and foremost. And she has um, a lot of experience uh, servicing uh, difficult uh, field missions. Uh, and as chief of the interpretation, interpretation service today, um, we can also get the perspective of the organization uh, with regards to the uh, safety and especially mental health of interpreters. So I'll start with the first question, Marie, and how did you react to this film and your experience? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alma, and thank you um, to the organizer, because I think that um, uh, sessions like this are really, really very important because, as you said, Elian, uh, people uh, don't always realize what is the job of the interpreters mm -hmm. when they are in the field and what can happen to the interpreters, I mean, psychologically speaking, when they are working in this kind of situation. So thank you for showing that mm -hmm. and thank you to the interpreters that are participating to the movie. So uh, to answer your question, Alma, I think that... Um, the organization actually realized um, a decade ago that those kind of missions, you know, special rapporteur missions, like uh, Manfred just said, can actually have a psychological toll on the interpreters. So um, before my wife here, I was still in Vienna at the time, uh, but UNOC organized a um, special uh, session with the staff counselor and with CLM uh, with interpreters. Uh, first of all, there were a sort of well-being uh, workshop, uh, you know, and it was also a moment for the interpreters to say what they were actually going through and for the interpreters to be aware of what they could go through when they go on those missions. Uh, because, you know, sometimes missions are taken, you know, it's a mission, I'm going, but it's important to be aware of what can happen when you come back. So I think... Um, 
the important thing is for the organization to be aware of that. And after that, there was a movie that was made also by one of our colleagues, by Cristobal Osuna, uh, you know, interviewing interpreters going there and so the interpreters could talk about their experience. And then um, we organized, and I was uh, already in Geneva, we organized um, a workshop with the University of Geneva. And um, part, I mean, there was one session in the workshop when we talk about that, when we talk about the psychological toll, about the well-being of the interpreters, about the consequences. So I think all of this is important because, um, as we have seen in the movie, um, the psychological toll is there, even if you have been an interpreter for years, even if you have been doing those missions for years. You know, for years, like one of the interpreters said, you know, at a certain one word. You just hear one word and you're like, I can't do this anymore. And you start crying. So those are very difficult uh, situations, very difficult. Um, so it's a difficult job uh, when you go in the field. And I'm very happy that the organization has realized that. And we were supposed to organize other workshops with the University of Geneva, but then COVID hit and then we could not do it. And I was very proud, I must say, of the, of the interpreters in the service here at UNOG, because basically the interpreters, so it's not only the organizations that understood that it was important to take care of the well-being of the interpreters, but the interpreters themselves understood that. And this is why when we organized the first workshop with the University of Geneva, everybody signed up and we could not get everybody. So some people, you know, could not participate because there were too many people and we wanted the workshop to be with, uh, with a smaller group. And uh, so we will continue to organize those kind of workshops because I think that it's important for, for everybody. It's important for the organization, it's important for, um, for the interpreters, and it's, it's important um, for the person we are servicing. Um, because as one of the interpreters said in the movie, Seeing what uh, we see, what we could see, seeing what's really happening, seeing the sufferings of the people, I think the interpreters, and especially UNOG interpreters, have all understood that our role is to do a fucking job, like the interpreter said in the movie. And this is exactly what we are doing. So I'm very proud of the interpreters in the service. And thank you very much again, Eliane, for this movie, because the movie showed really what it's all about. And, um, and even, even as an interpreter, you know, if you are, because in Geneva, it's where there are the most, you know, there are a lot of missions. So if you are not an interpreter in Geneva, you don't do those kind of missions. You know, this is a reality. If you, you know, you do all kind of missions, but not special rapporteur mission and things like that. And you don't realize what it's about. You really don't realize. So it's good for people to show this is what it's about. This is what it's about. So thank you for this and thank you for organizing this. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, yes, Geneva services, uh, the, 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 the vast majority of these missions. And, um, after some missions, I was so down, so devastated. Uh, Besmir spoke of the dreams, uh, the feeling of guilt, the feeling of, I can just take my car and drive and go to Miko when I know what I left behind wherever I was. Uh, psychologically, I did not always handle it very well. Nevertheless, I kept going on these missions. I've done over 30 so far, and I look forward to the next one. And I was wondering why. And I think it's because of what is so rewarding from these missions on a purely human point of view, and where our job as interpreters becomes, the, for me, the most important, the voice of just normal, regular people and a true instrument of communication. I will uh, take a question from the chat and then a question from the floor and hope we can have an interactive dialogue. Uh, the first question from the, the chat, as interpreters, how long did it take to recover emotionally and mentally after this hard experience? 
um, I'm, I'm assuming the, the question is addressed to the uh, interpreter from the film. Uh, and maybe, Bismir, you can uh, provide uh, an answer from your experience, especially after that month you mentioned. Yes, uh, uh, good morning again. Uh, well, uh, the thing is, if you were carefully listening to my story, you will see how I was working on myself and on my own feelings from the very beginning of my engagement with ICTY. My first engagement with ICTY was on a mass grave. So I could actually hear the remains of people of, from Srebrenica. They were still, uh, I'm going to uh, be a little bit morbid. I, I know you're going to forgive me. You can still see the remains of flesh as well. This was in 1996. They were killed in July and August. So you could still see the remains of flesh and even on the faces and, you know. So I saw them for who they are. You, you, hear, you hear me say in the movie, I went there to see them and I prayed for them. I uh, uh, said a uh, Muslim prayer for the dead for them. Uh, and I made my peace with them. I said, hi, I'm here. And then I went on with my work. The thing that troubled me with those two men uh, who were in the concentration camp is my fear of, of enclosed spaces. I, want, I cannot stand closed spaces. Um, and then later on, I guess there were so many little things uh, that later on when the story about the boy, it really hit me. Uh, I, when I said in the movie that I was drunk uh, for a month, I wasn't joking. Um, I was drunk for a month. I, you know, wake up in the morning, have my coffee, and I try to go to work. I can't go to work. I just pull out a bottle of whiskey instead. And then when I'm done, then I take red wine and it goes, you know. Uh, it, uh, uh, I wanted his energy. I knew his mother never knew what happened to him. I wanted to cry for him and I cried for him. I let him into my home and I'm happy I did. So he is always with me um, and he always will remain with me. But uh, uh, you never really recover from uh, accumulated stress from, uh, I think Mr. Manfred said, we are in business of misery, you know, and when you don't take care of that misery, it only piles up, you know, uh, and you just carry it around. If we had uh, in the UN uh, uh, stigma-free psychological support or debriefing system, we wouldn't have to carry any of this around, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you never really uh, recover from stuff like that. You just carry it around with you and uh, and it's okay. It's okay to carry it around. Thank you, uh, Bismir. I just react to the stigma-free psychological support. I believe things are changing and uh, the UN, as we have heard now from Marie, um, is, is providing and will hopefully continue and increase the provision of such support. Um, I look uh, in the room, I see my colleagues and uh, many of them have a lot of experience uh, about this question of recovering emotionally. I see the first colleague in front of me. Would you like to add something, uh, Dan, if, if you wish, I mean? just to make it interactive. I wasn't going to say anything. Um, for, for so <laughs> um, I, I, if, if I can share the, the, the fact that I, I never ex expected to be affected by any of the missions I went on. But uh, back in 2017, I had a period where I was having a lot of migraines. Um, I'd been, uh, hadn't, hadn't been recently to, to a, on a mission, but uh, um, I called a, uh, a friend of mine who's a doctor and uh, I went, discussed my, my migraines and, and uh, other things that were going through my head. And uh, I, I mentioned the phrase, um, you know, of course, we're trained to, uh, to keep a distance. And then he, he said to me, actually, I bet you're not. We are, as, as, as doctors, we're trained to do that. But you're probably not. And I went, 
Actually, that's true. We've never really received, received any training. That was the first time it dawned on me that uh, perhaps uh, things had been accumulated, accumulating. Um, obviously, obviously, you don't go through all the things that the, parent, the people you have been in, in, uh, helping to interview have gone through, but somehow um, thing, things do stay. Um, that's it. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, any questions from the room now? Yes, please, Shirin. It's not a question, it's just a comment. And first of all, thank you very much. It's, it was really a great film. And I wasn't expecting to learn more about us by somebody who's not an interpreter, and it was really, really excellent. And I just wanted to say something, maybe it's another perspective. I wanted to say that I was a bit surprised by the fact that I wasn't really thinking about the interpreters. I was thinking about the victims because I think that at the UN, we integrated the idea that we are working really for these people. Uh, Besmir talked about uh, the deaths, the angels and the ghost, and I think that a lot of interpreters uh, do not think about themselves when working. They really think about the kind of service we can offer these people and the organization, which is something extremely maybe professional. At the same time, of course, it has a price, but I think that a lot of interpreters uh, do forget themselves. Uh, while working, and I think this is something that Besmir said. I mean, it was so beautifully said, uh, ghosts and angels, and yes, we are working especially for these people and also for people who are still alive, I hope. So thank you very much for all of you. Thank you. It was really beautiful. Thank you, Shireen. Any further questions from the room? Please, Rebecca. I just wanted to thank everybody involved, Eliane and the interpreters involved, for reminding me why we do this job and um, inspiring us to be even better at what we do when we do this job. And um, to take up the question of another point which was raised in the film, the issue, yes, of giving a voice to the victims and about how you feel about that and, and uh, dealing with um, everything that you are hearing and which is, which is being communicated through you, but also the fact that you are the voice of all sides in this situation and that you have to be professional and do your job and give voice to all sides. And sometimes that is one of the most difficult parts I've found in dealing with this kind of any interpretation, both in the field and in simultaneous. And uh, what Alma organized with the University of Geneva, the absolute best part of that was the colleagues sharing experience and coming together and talking about coping mechanisms and validating each other's experience. As you said, Vesmir, uh, you're being heard. The feeling that you're being heard, that you've been recognized by your colleagues, that has been acknowledged and being able to openly talk about it with no stigma and um, look at yeah, ways to cope, ways to professionally manage in situations and to discuss it afterwards. And so I'd like to ask you, uh, Alma Marie, Kira, and uh, the interpreters present, what we could do perhaps better to support each other. And in the larger UN, with our colleagues who have so much experience from you know, the ICTY, the International Criminal Court as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Would you like to react to that, uh, Marie or Kira? Um, uh, thank you for saying that, Rebecca, because I do think um, that um, there are still plenty of things that we could do. And, um, and we could um, start a discussion about that and see what can be done. But um, as I said, um, it's only you know, a decade ago that the organization realized that there was a psychological toll and something needed to be done. And uh, so we started uh, slowly with the courses, with, uh, you know, we have two colleagues doing a PhD also on the matter and things like that. But um, there is still a long way to go. There is still a long way to go. And as you said, there are resources out there. 
you know, there are colleagues that are doing it, you know, colleagues like Besme and other colleagues, you know, there are resources out there that we should use. And uh, so thank you for this suggestion because I think it's a great suggestion. So I don't know if, Kira, you want to add something. Yeah, I, I echo what Marie had said. I think it's, it's really important. First of all, this is an amazing experience. Um, and it reminded me of something I hadn't thought in years of when I was doing prison visits uh, when I was a consular officer. And you, oh yes, and it's quite interesting as a, as a white girl from the California suburbs to wind up doing prison visits. Um, now I didn't have, I, the, the State Department visits Americans in overseas prisons, so that was what that was about. But I, I think what we need to do is think about the, the whole cycle. So first of all, you know, and, and, and I think um, Manfred mentioned some of this, and I really appreciate the comment he made about the care that he as the head of these missions had to bring everybody together and let people debrief and acknowledge that, yes, this is hard. It can be very difficult for people to acknowledge when something is hard, especially as a manager, because you want everything to be easy and, oh, it'll be fine. But I think, first of all, just even an, an event like this, acknowledging that this is hard is super important. I think when people come together, taking a look and even having a discussion, okay, this is what this mission is likely is, is to be, this is where we're going, this is what you might see, this is what you might experience, and maybe even early on, even when you're starting to look at volunteers, because as, as Alma had alluded to, a lot of people are like, oh, this is a mission, this will be interesting. But you know, you're not going to places you'd go on vacation to. So people need to understand what that means. So I think some initial thoughts about that. I think we should look into getting some, some particular training. The point that you made, Daniel, I think was very good, is that how, how can we train ourselves to maintain distance? And of course, because you are listening, you listen to what people say, you need to take it into the point where you understand it well enough to send it back out. So you can't just keep a big upstand, a big distance. No, you have to let it in. How can you make it all go? And that is where I think if we can get some training on that. And I do think having, I mean, a support group always sounds very sort of squishy, but what you had said, Rebecca, was really important. People need to talk about this. And if people think, well, I'm the only one who was upset. Am I weak? Am I a problem? Am I never going to get to go on a mission again? So I think, I think we need a variety of things before the mission, after the mission, a debriefing, talking to people. I know Kali, a friends of mine, you know, my, my sister's in the Foreign Service, her husband. You know, people come back for, came back from Afghanistan. State Department followed up with them because people often had psychological issues that they didn't really want to deal with. So we need to follow up after the mission, and not only immediately after the mission, but also we probably should work out, find out what would be a good practice, maybe three months, a month, and just follow up again, because often people don't know how it's going to affect them. You're just so relieved to be done. So if you come back a month later or a couple months later, how are you doing? You know, do you want to talk about that? Um, I think that kind of thing could be important. And then the work that's being done with the university is also really valuable. So, but I, I think we really should look at it sort of in a bigger sense, give people training in general, um, all the way down to very specifically, here's some mission, let's prepare for it properly, get people thinking, and when it's done, let's close it up and then come back to make sure that everything that might be sitting in there, has it been processed or is it still in there? So that's my thought, and I'd like to really think, this was um, Alma and Marie came to me with the idea to do this, and I'm just so grateful that it's worked out. Really, thank you so much. So, thanks. Thank you, Kira. Um, as we're speaking about uh, uh, training, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, Besmir, I, I... Can I chime in just for one second? Please. Uh, I was working with this uh, a long time ago. I was working with uh, uh, this American lawyer, and he was one of the lawyers who actually contributed to eradicating Ku Klux Klan in, uh, from California and, uh, and, and the West Coast in general. And uh, uh, he was looking at me, and he said, uh, uh, Besmir, how do you cope with all of this? I was very, very young interpreter at the time. And uh, uh, I didn't really react, you know, uh, to him as a client. I mean, he's a client. And he said, you know what, Besmir, I'm going to teach you a very useful trick. And you're going to think it's strange, but uh, it is very useful trick. We work with, uh, with misery and we work with human scum sometimes as well. And what I do is I come to my home and I call my wife and I, in front of my door, I take all of my clothes. I enter in and I go and I take a shower. I don't want any of that energy 
in my home, in my private space. And I have been doing the same thing for years, you know, not to bring any of that ugliness into my home, you know. And also acknowledge the fact when you're working with colleagues, acknowledge the fact that we are working on adrenaline, you know, and adrenaline is not our friend. It makes us, <clears throat> you know, and we are <clears throat> only at wrong people all the time. So that's from me. Thank you, Bismir. Uh, sharing uh, coping mechanisms is a, a very important element. And I would like to go back to Manfred. Um, when Dan, you mentioned that the doctor told you he got training for that kind of thing, I was wondering, Manfred, um, do you, as an expert, I mean, have you personally, because, you know, you have an accumulation of experience in difficult things, do you, have you ever had training? And number two, would you have any recommendations for us interpreters? Um, may, I, may, I, may I start perhaps to follow up what Besmir just said? Um, that might sound strange uh, to you, but um, when we were on missions, I always insisted uh, it could be, I didn't need the, the best hotels, it could be a three star hotel, or whatever, but it was important to have a swimming pool. And sometimes you come, you, you get up at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, you're driving through difficult terrain, it's hot. Then you are visiting, I don't know, how many different places of detention. It's, uh, you're sweating like crazy. You are, the smell already, if you, if you come into, into prisons is, if, if you have never smelled it before, I mean, the smell will never leave you. Uh, if, if I, it's, it's, it's something very, very special. Um, and, um, and then doing all this, this uh, interviews, hearing all this misery, not only interviewing uh, victims of torture and detainees, we were also interviewing perpetrators, um, uh, which is sometimes even more difficult because they might be aggressive, they might be, um, and, uh, and then coming home at 10 or 11 in, in the evening, finally to your hotel, it was such a relief simply to, again, as you said, take off your clothes and just jump for 10 minutes in a swimming pool. Um, that, that also had a, a healing um, a healing function. And, uh, and then sitting down and having the debriefing round um, was something, again, which I, which I did. The same when I, after a mission, sometimes it's three weeks, um, then you are coming home. I had small children at that time. And, um, and uh, I, I would never actually talk about uh, that with my family, I, I I just kept it. But at the same time, you have to deal with it. In the nights, it comes back as a flashback, etc. So, uh, but uh, again, not bringing the story back into the home, uh, I think was for me also very very important. Now, going back to your to your question, I never had a formal training, um, but I worked already when I was. Uh, uh, a young university assistant with a professor um, who uh, was one of the first UN experts. He was member of the working group in South Africa that was established in 1967. And in 1975, he was a member of the working group on human rights in, in Chile. He was president of the Human Rights Commission. Later, he became the first special rapporteur in Afghanistan after the Soviet invasion. Um, and I worked a lot with him. And uh, we worked together on, we, we did a fact-finding mission uh, for the for the church, uh, for the Catholic church in on, on killings. Um, of landless peasants in Brazil uh, and these kind of things. So I, I kind of learned it from from others when I when I uh, went with them uh, on a, on a fact finding mission. And then you develop certain skills how you should do um, uh, interviews, etc. Um, but as I said, we we never or I never really had any kind of psychological. Um, education, how, how do I deal with this kind of, of traumas and how do I also protect the team with whom I am I'm actually um, uh, going on mission and, um, 
it's it's also a lot of is is learning learning by doing um and uh, of course we had these regular meetings of uh, special rapporteurs and they worked very closely together on the Guantanamo Bay investigation uh, or later on secret places of detention in the fight against terrorism with uh, the special rapporteur on summary executions uh, the the special rapporteur on anti as a on terrorism and 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 human rights etc so of course you also exchange uh, your experiences uh, also with the former special operators on torture like Nigel Rodley or Theo von Boven, etc. So, um, yeah, it's um, I, I think it's something. And now we are teaching it. Um, I mean, I, I teach in various master programs um, students who might soon be in the situation that they are going into the field. Um, and we do skills training. What does it mean? How do you do an interview? How do you deal in a with a dangerous situation what are the un security rules that you have to follow and these kind of things um, i think that is important and as uh, as as many said uh, going on this kind of missions is a totally different experience and uh, you you are protected by un security um, but um, you still never know in what kind of situation you're coming and sometimes UN security is even endangering you. I, I just give you one example. When we <clears throat> were in Equatorial Guinea, which in, was one of the two, so I, I had eight in fact finding missions. Only one country I didn't find torture, and that was Denmark and Greenland. 17 countries I found torture, but two were really systematic torture. And that was Nepal in the time of the armed conflict in Equatorial Guinea as a classical dictatorship, where more or less every single person whom we visited in the prison or, det or police detention has been tortured. And then we approached again uh, this this main big, big police station, and we were threatened. Um, the first time we could go there because, uh, yeah, that, but not the second time. And then, um, and then there was a police, uh, no, a soldier standing and saying, no, you can't enter this this police station anymore. Um, and then I had a a, a kind of a, a very tough security guy who said, no, no, but you know, this is the UN special operator on torture. Go away, we go in. And the soldier simply said, um, I have no orders to talk to you. I have only orders to shoot you. Um, and I, together with, again, the interpreter, we, we had to to help to calm down the security officer. So this is something that you, you wouldn't train, whatever. So you have to be very flexible in all these situations, also to, uh, to kind of, uh, yeah, see what the risks are. Or when, when my driver was all of a sudden arrested by uh, in, in also in Ecuadorian Guinea by in, in a military camp again without the interpreters I wouldn't really have been able to get the guy out uh, from detention anymore and um, so so these kind of things interpreters play an extremely important role also of mediating very often because they speak the language um, and and uh, they can mediate a, a dangerous situation, um, which they also didn't learn before. Uh, but um, um, yeah, I'm 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 extremely grateful to so many of you for for incredible work under very very tough circumstances. But on the other hand, also Alma, what you said, why do we do that? Because I mean, for us also, it's it's pro bono work. Uh, but we do it because. On the one hand, we try to improve the human rights situation. We are human rights people. Uh, but on the other hand, also, it is an incredible experience for the rest of your life. You, you, you see, I mean, most people have never been in a prison. Prison have this kind of prison walls in order to keep prisoners in, but also the public out. And the public doesn't really know what's going on behind closed doors. Um, and... Uh, to really, uh, it, it's a totally different world. Nelson Mandela once said, prisons are the business card of countries. If you want to get to know a country, first you have to go to a prison. And I think it's a very, very wise sentence. Um, it's a different world. Um, and 
those who are there, who are seen by the society, they are the worst of the worst. They are the criminals. They are the terrorists. They are the killers and whatever. They, these are human beings. And you enter into a normal relationship with them. Many might be innocent, but even if they committed a crime, they are individuals who have human rights. They should be treated not like uh, animals or whatever. Many say the animals if 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 you if you you would never treat your animals in the way how people treating us uh, here that is a, a sentence that I heard from so many prisoners in, in in many different countries. Thank you, thank you so much, Manfred. And indeed, a lot of learning by doing, and uh, the new awareness of the importance of health. Uh, for interpreters and maybe other categories of staff, but we're speaking here of interpreters. Um, this new awareness is something that will uh, hopefully lead uh, us to uh, uh, base ourselves on the, this, on the exchanges and, uh, and move forward. Uh, time is unfortunately up. Uh, it's extremely interesting. I think we could talk for a long time, but with the authorization of the panelists, I would like to hear some last words from Eliane and uh, maybe ask her, could you maybe think of doing another one? <laughs> No. Yes, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question because uh, after finishing this film, uh, it's a little bit like um, a child that you don't want to let go of, you know, because I, I worked for several years on the film and also in, on, in cooperation with, with Alma and Besmeer and Pops. And I still feel there's, there's a lot to tell, that the subject is not finished. So I'm working on a small publication with their full uh, interview, which is being published. And I was thinking, but this is very preliminary, that it would be beautiful to make a podcast with different interpreters, working on different uh, field missions or different circumstances, different languages, and especially a podcast because I also made a performance together with uh, Pops and Alma, uh, uh, which, we which was mostly audio, and I, I realized that for the audiences, audio is enough. I mean, yes, the film is visual, but audio is so powerful. So therefore I was thinking, if I continue working on the subject, it should be a podcast. And then, of course, it should be international because, uh, yeah, it's uh, many languages. So that's, that's an idea, yeah. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, before we, we close, uh, I would like, of course, to thank every one of you, especially um, uh, Kira, Eliane, Marie, uh, Manfred, and uh, Besmir. But I would also like to acknowledge all the work that went into organizing this event, uh, especially all the colleagues from uh, uh, Kira's office, the director's office. Uh, Vadim, thank you so much. Uh, Cloda, Lai, uh, a fabulous team behind the scenes. And I hope it was um, an Antigone, of course. And I'm sure there are many others. Uh, sorry, um, for with all the technical team as well. So um, if I forgot anybody, uh, excuse me for that. And maybe just as she started, Kira can wrap up our event today. Thank you so much, Alma. And again, I echo the thanks for everyone who participated. I also want to take the opportunity to thank our interpreter colleagues for taking time out to come. And then very much to thank you for the work that you do in supporting these missions. Um, you know, this is really, to me, this crystallizes the work of the United Nations. It's out, it's among individual people. It's about the people who are affected by horrible things. Um, and the work that you do allows colleagues like uh, Manfred to do his work and help get the message out. So really, your work is absolutely uh, crucial. And of course, it's in a way, it is far too unsung. So I also thank Eliana and, and Besmir and the others who participated in the film for helping give people a, a greater understanding. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's clear that we have a lot of work to do. Um, 
it's very clear that the situation in the world continues to be complicated. I joined the Foreign Service in 1991, um, and there was, I remember Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History. Well, that didn't work out so well. Um, but the, we will clearly continue to have uh, situations that need on the ground investigations, field missions, and we will continue to need the work of interpreters. Um, so what we need to do from my side as a, as a manager, working with Marie, working with others who have special skills, special interest, is figure out how can we make your work as effective as possible, make it so that you don't have to leave your clothes at the front door and take a dip in a hot water to hopefully leave some of this all behind you. So what we can do, we will see what we can do, but it is, of course, a journey, and we need to do this collectively. Anything we do needs to work for the people who use it. So it's, it's clearly there's lots to do, but again, thank you so much for the work you do, have done, and will do.